relationship, he can stick by his guns and refuse the interpretation, which means everlasting dissonance and conflict with Sigmund Freud, who's his claim to fame in the world. Or he can give in to Sigmund Freud and keep Freud's favor and remain on friendly, loving terms with Freud, which is what he chose to do. He capitulated, he surrendered to the pressure Freud put him under. He gave in and said, yes, you're right, Dr. Freud. He gave up his own independent, self-assertive judgment that this was wrong and said, I accept that what you're saying is true and I was the one who was wrong. That is a symbolic castration. It's like he pulled his penis out and said, Freud said, you have to accept it, or, or otherwise we're just going to be forever alienated from each other. And the, and the patient said, I accept it, and Freud took the axe away and didn't have to chop off the penis, right? <coughs> but yet the patient had chopped it off himself <coughs> by the, surrender, the act of surrender itself. I think the injury to this man's self-assertive will, his own knowledge of himself, is symbolized in the hole in the nose. That's why the hole in the nose is a phallic symbol. It's, it's a symbol of a kind of metaphorical castration. That's why these, these guys, Freudian psychoanalysis is so weird. It's never just wrong. It's always right yet wrong, or wrong yet right. And that, that's what you have to get used to studying it. It's so interesting in that way. So now, arcing all the way back to the Wolfman's family, I think the story there, the great, the great family themes, not elaborated by Freud, it's my hypothesis really, more than, it's, more than anything I can defend with factual uh, evidence from, from the case studies that are there. But my sense is that uh, in order to feel accepted and loved in the Wolfman's family, it was necessary to give up your own independent will and just let yourself be exploited and used and passively taken advantage of by mother, by father, by an older sister. There's some evidence of sexual abuse in the family. It's not conclusive, but it might have been there. But what I see is a pattern of emotional exploitation of the wolfman himself, where the child gives up his own will, his own self-defense, his own self-assertion, in order to be pleasing, to give the parents what they want, and in return, he gets whatever, accept, whatever acceptance and love they can muster or, or that he can secure. That's a kind of castration itself. So, see, Freud saw the great theme of the case, if you want daddy's love, you have to submit to castration. I think metaphorically it was correct, actually. It's a correct interpretation. You have to give up your own independent self, and then you can have daddy's and maybe mommy's love and maybe the older sister's love as well, okay? I don't know if I'm making myself clear or not. But so, so I see Freud's interpretation as oddly right, but upside down and backwards, and overly literal. Literal. One more thing about it, it's so interesting to me. The Wolfman, in his own recollections about this, his encounter with Sigmund Freud, recalls uh, a moment when he first met Freud, like the very first day when he went in to see him. And the Wolfman uh, almost like heard a voice or had a thought come in out of nowhere. I don't know whether it was a voice or a thought, it doesn't matter. But the voice or thought said something like this, watch out for that dirty old Jew. It sounds anti-Semitic, but was, I'm speaking for the Wolfman here. Watch out for that dirty old Jew. He'll come up on you and let you have it right from behind. And the Wolfman set that thought aside and said, no, 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 no. And went on, and went on with Freud and went on to the whole thing. And went on, I think, eventually to his own castration as Freud proved some of his fancy theories that he was trying to create, OK? And I thought of the book uh, by Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Blink. Any of you guys have read, of that, read that at all? It's kind of interesting. If you haven't read it, I don't recommend it really. It's a little bit snake oil, but it has, it has a nice thought in it. Blink, Blink says that uh, some t it, it's a recent book. It's very, very popular, millions of copies sold. If you haven't read it, where, where have you been? Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> anyway, um, my da daughter loves it and got, got me a copy of it, so I made a point of reading it because she likes it so much. But, it's the idea that sometimes our first estimate, like just if we just blink at something and take in a scene, <coughs> our minds can like penetrate to the heart of the matter. We get in trouble when we start thinking too hard and analyzing and everything, and then we just go off on the wrong track. I thought maybe the Wolfman blinked a little bit of Freud in Gladwell's sense. This dirty old Jew will let you have it right from behind. Watch out. Okay, but then he, dis he discounted that. I think, I think that's exactly what happened to him. His own view, though, there's, there's a book called The Wolfman that includes, um, I forget the author, the, the Wolfman's name itself, I can't even remember now. You 
look it up on Google if you want to, Amazon, whatever. But it, it has a Freud study, Ruth Mac Brunswick's follow-up study, and then the Wolfman's own autobiography. And it's very interesting to me that when you read the Wolfman's own autobiography, he celebrates his, his wonderful relationship with Freud, considered himself to be a kind of partner in a journey of adventuring discoverers of the human psyche and all like that, which is how Freud thought of it too. But uh, at the end of that, as the essay the Wolfman gives us, he says he never really, he decided after all that Freud was wrong. It was all bullshit about his, his analysis of the whole thing, just BS from top to bottom. And I thought that was really interesting. And, and I think that that shows that he recovered his own judgment and returned to his own self-assertive will. And maybe it has something to do, or it's related to the fact that the hole in the nose disappeared. The hole in the nose being a symbol of the injury that he had incurred by having to surrender to Freud to hold on to the relationship that was there. Okay? So Freud is so weird, you know? Like, where would I be without Freud? I don't know. I would not be in psychology. I discovered psychology in the early exposure to Freud when I was just a high school student. I studied everything he ever wrote inside and out. I just find it to be massively wrong in a thousand different ways. I built a whole career on my own. My own career is like, in a way, my particular version of what was wrong in Sigmund Freud. Countless careers have been generated out of that, so you're ended up in, indebted to this man. And the time is not here now and will not come in the foreseeable future when you guys either can, can afford to really ignore what he has to say. But isn't that interesting? Now, circling all the way back to my major theme, though, do you see how it works? Freud looks at this dream. I look at the dream as, as, a, as a kind of metaphor of a predatory childhood situation where the other people in his family, symbolized by the wolves, are basically eat in, the, in the process of or in danger of eating him alive, eating him right up. I see it like right on the surface. It's not disguised. It's a metaphor the child is using. Freud sees it as this very indirect, hidden, intricate symbol of all this crazy trauma that may or may not have happened. I don't think so. Also, I don't think a person is undone by watching their parents having sex. Just if you have this happen, some child might make an interpretation and do something with it. I would tend to see the kind of symptom that the Wolfman has about being cut off from the outside world. The people I have known, I, I did not know the Wolfman personally, obviously, but I have known other people who had such symptoms. And what I see is a, a disturbance in their relationship to parents and caregivers where they never felt seen for who they were. This is Sylvia Plath's story, by the way. Sylvia Plath's life story is a battle with her mother's narcissism. Her mother took advantage of her, made use of her, was a kind of wolf on her life in an important way. And Sylvia Plath's struggle was to give voice to her own authentic, separate selfhood, uh, 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 which she did tremendously through her literature, but finally could only go so far and had to end up killing herself. Okay, guys, well, let's stop there today. Uh, I wouldn't listen to the world.